at the end of the 16th century, London audiences began to enjoy theatre going in indoor playhouses, as well as at the outdoor amphitheatres like the Globe. There'd been a number of uh, different venues in which sort of indoor playing was, was taking place from schools and universities, drama, through to the Inns of Court in London, which we know was a really important breeding ground for what then became the sort of commercial drama of, of the early modern period that we all know and, and, and understand. So it's, it's not as though that the indoor playhouses sort of appeared fully formed overnight. They come out of this longer tradition, which had seen people, particularly in educational contexts, having a go at performances in candlelight in smaller, more intimate spaces, often with select audiences. The first professional indoor playhouse is built in 1576, the same year as the first outdoor, permanent outdoor uh, playhouse, the theatre, in the north of London. Then we move forward a bit, and uh, James Burbage, who's built the theatre, realises that his lease is running out in 1597. And so he bought uh, not the same part of the Blackfriars Monastery that the earlier playhouse had been in, but a larger first floor space. Burbage, always with an eye to business opportunities, I suppose seeing in, in a part the sort of growing appetite for uh, theatre in the city, and in particular the location is tempting because it's near to things like the Inns of Court, and as well as acting we know that lawyers were great playgoers, they are a kind of core set of people in the audiences of the time, so he knows he's got a ready market, um, it's just across the way from the Royal Wardrobes, so there's also access to costumes and props, very interesting set of decisions that might have taken him to that site. Indoor playing was clearly very attractive. For a start, it was warm and dry. Uh, they charged more, so roughly six times the price of the outdoor playhouse, and you could play in the winter. Audience sitting on three sides, um, so quite close to the action and seated. There's another difference with the open air amphitheatres. We no longer have the, the groundlings, as it were, in the pit standing. Nevertheless, quite close to the stage, um, very much something that the actors would have been highly conscious of. And from references in, in a number of the plays, we're aware that some uh, members of the audience got to actually sit on the stage. And that changes the dynamic of what happens with plays as well. The indoor playhouse at Blackfriars was at first the home of a company of boy players. It appealed to a richer, more privileged clientele who enjoyed the plays known as city comedies by, among others, the fashionable young writer Ben Jonson. Eastwood Ho by Ben Jonson and Marston and Chapman. That's showing the move into the indoor theatres um, in the 1600s. And, 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 and the, the poking and prodding is really annoying. So that, that and that and that. Is he come and then yeah. back to be dressed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we're still been... imagining everybody's out here. So I'm, oh, okay. I'm making you play out. Off with this gown, for shame's sake. Off with this gown! Let not my night take me in the city cut in any hand. Tear it! Pex out! Has he come? And put your head back and just say, now. Now. And do it. Slap. Yeah, cool. Great. And then, and then yeah. if you turn back oh, for... No. Uh, uh, just make sure your cheeks are nice and red. Oh. So at the beginning of the 17th century, you get this uh, class of plays which we call city comedies, uh, which are largely but not exclusively indoors. And they start, I think, to be satirical plays about London uh, and about the uh, venality of the, the city. And these early city comedies are basically satires about London. They're all set in the city. So do, does a lady move really slowly? Does, and and, and, the and then do, do they ever move really fast? OK. <laughs> does the court layer a trot? Is it the right, Scott? Does it clip up close and... Uh, Bear up round. City comedy, social satire about London, 
endlessly tells the audience it's turning the mirror on them. Um, our scene is London and so on and so forth. And they seem to have loved that, even though in many ways these plays have quite deep criticisms of what's going on. There seems to be an attraction of seeing something that's absolutely of its moment, of its place and time, of that month, in that year. And that frisson of the immediate just seems to have excited, in particular, the Blackfriars audience. The Blackfriars seems to be a theatre that loved novelty. And your father may call her poor night son-in-law. Come, come, the day grows low, it is supper time. Use my house. The wedding solemnity will be at my wife's cost. Thank me for nothing but my willing blessing, for I cannot feign, my hopes are faint. Eastwood Ho, which was first staged in 1605, was commissioned by the Blackfriars Company of boy actors known as the Children of the Queen's Revels. The Children of the Queen's Revels seem to have wanted a play that would think about uh, a group of people in a particular area of London because they'd seen the success of their rivals with a play called uh, Westwood Ho, which had been written by Thomas Decker and John Webster. And the Children of the Queen's Revels uh, bring in, as it were, some really sort of cutting edge dramatists to have a go at their version with Eastwood Ho. So we get Ben Johnson. Uh, we, we get uh, John Marston, who's actually in chambers at the Inns of Court at the time, so very much part of this legal world on the edges of the Blackfriars that we've previously referred to, and we get George Chapman. And they've all been writers, interestingly, who have been living a little on the edge, shall we say, with their material. They've been in and out of trouble uh, in, over the last sort of five years prior to the writing of Eastwood Ho. So it seems almost as if the Commission is deliberately bringing in people who will uh, take some risks with the material. In fact, some anti-Scottish references in the play so offended the new king, James I and VI of Scotland, that Ben Jonson and George Chapman were thrown into jail for a short time. Off with it! For shame's sake, off with it! Let not my knight see me in the city cut in any hand. Tear it! Pack songs! Does he come? Tear it off! That's why she sleeps. A sorrow for oh, sister, with what an immodest impatiency and disgraceful scorn do you put off your city tire. I'm sorry to think you right yourself in wronging that which have made both you and us. I think the plays are quite good at sort of factionalising and getting a dynamic in the theatre itself. I think with these plays, you're not just watching the play, as it were, you're in the event. So when in Eastwood Ho, you've got the presentation of Touchstone and Golding and Mildred, the solid middle class bunch, then you've got Quicksilver, who I suspect a lot of boys on the stage who comes from a different class recognise something of, and then you've got Gertrude with her aspirations, wanting to wear the best clothes, and completely taken in by Sir Petronel Flash, what a name that is, uh, who is one of these new knights. Uh, which is what got the player into trouble, of course, that satire. Modesty, am I not to be married? <laughs> oh, you can keep me modest. Uh, boldness is, is good fashion and court-like. Aye, oh, and a country lady, I hope it is, as I shall be. And how come you came no sooner, Knight? But at its heart is this world of money and aspiration, and I think Gertrude is such a fantastic character to think about in this light, with her fervent longing, need, craving for coaches, for a castle in the country which turns out to be a castle in the air. I mean, that's a line in the play. When we first see her on the stage, she's surrounded by people carrying fabrics and, and costumes and the latest sort of trinkets and fashions of the day. This would be a play that um, is surprisingly full of things on the stage. You can imagine the candlelight of the Blackfriars picking up on all of that rich material as Paul Davy, the, the tailor, sort of fusses around them. And it's brilliant to think about what that might have said to people in the audience who were themselves clamouring to have the sort of latest, most fashionable lap dog or pet monkey of the day. Um, to suddenly see that up on the stage and what that was saying about them and their, their craving for novelty, for fashion, for voguish behaviour. Count Eponoon, a Welsh knight. We had a match at Balloon with my Lord Wackham for four crowns. A baboon? Jesus, you and I will play a baboon in the country night. Oh, sweet lady, tis a strong play with the arm. Mm -hmm.